Hi, I'm Misty Jesse, and I welcome you to our Growing in the Word Gospel of Mark online series. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, which is Unit 4. We're going to be covering chapters 11 through part of chapter 14. Before we begin, let's take a moment to clear our thoughts and open our minds and heart to the Word of God as I begin our study with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together and providing us many ways to study your word. Be with us now. Fill us with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Help us enrich our faith as we explore the meaning of your teachings in the past and in our lives today. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today, um, this unit opens with Jesus' dramatic entry into Jerusalem. Mark paints a vivid scene filled with detailed imagery. Jesus is in control. He takes the initiative, and he sends two disciples ahead of him to secure a young, unridden colt, which is um, a term for a, a baby donkey, for his use. He will show us the same initiative with the preparation for the Last Supper. Now, Jesus rides into the city on the back of this young colt. Traditionally, a king going to war will ride a horse as a sign of military might and power. But in contrast, we have Jesus riding this colt, which is a sign of humility, indicating that he's coming in peace. Now, think about this. It takes a lot of skill and effort to ride such an animal. And yet Jesus does this effortlessly affirming his power over nature. Just as he calmed the sea and the storms, now he controls animals. There is something unworldly in Jesus' strength and his peaceful demeanor. So we have this imagery. It's one of a peace-loving king entering into Jerusalem, not a warmonger. The greeting Jesus receives from the gathered crowds is one for a prophet of the coming messianic kingdom. So let's take a look. We're on chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 7 through 10. Chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. So they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Those preceding him as well as those following kept crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David, that is to come. Hosanna in the highest. He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple area. He looked around at everything and said it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now notice, they're not claiming him as Messiah. So they are acknowledging him as a prophet. So now he's left Jericho, all right? Um, and he's traveled upwards, upwards, upwards through here, through very rugged terrain. And the other gospels mention to us um, that there's the family of Lazarus uh, with M Martha and Mary, and they reside here in Bethany. It's most likely that after um, going to Jerusalem and leaving, you know, after his entrance, then he leaves, it says, um, he most likely would have gone back here and possibly stayed in Bethany um, at the home of Lazarus, where Mary and Martha are. Now, as Jesus heads into um, Jerusalem, his actions change from those of the healer and the preacher that we saw when he was around um, the Sea of Galilee to those now of an authoritative teacher and a seer, one who's going to be making specific prophecies. Notice how this ancient Roman road um, is graded with ridges. Here, see, can you see all these ridges? Okay, that's uh, intentional. This is done to help the animals and travelers with carts um, negotiate that steep incline and prevent slippage. Traditionally, when a king or a person of significance comes into a town, 
the main road of the city is lined with cloaks, is a sign of honor and respect. And then you would have crowds on either side waving leafy branches and shouting Hosanna, which means to save now. These are traditional signs of greeting. In Hebrew scriptures, um, in the Old Testament, there are specific references to the use of animals which have never been written. Um, we can find references in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 19, verse 2, and also in Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verse 3. Such animals are used for religious purposes by the priest or the Lord. So an unyoked, clean, and untainted animal is set aside for the purposes of God. Therefore, these actions taken by Jesus fulfill the prophecies of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So in the Holy Land, the donkey, the ass, is not a despised beast, but a noble one. Jesus is king. However, unlike a military king, Jesus came in peace. He's not planning to attack or overthrow Rome. So much of what we're seeing in Mark and also in the other Gospels is a looking backward into the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of that long-awaited-for Messiah. In Mark, Jesus is shown to be in control every step of the way. Jesus tells his disciples to go and get the colt. He's very specific about what he wants, and the request is fulfilled. Now let's think about this. If somebody came to your home and asked for your car, claiming it was for the master, just how likely do you think you're going to be um, in terms of handing over the keys. In Mark's gospel, there's no argument or question to the master's request. In all the events that will take place in Jerusalem, Jesus is always in charge. There's a plan, the plan will be executed, and the movement is forward. So here we have an aerial view of Jesus's movement, traveling from Bethany. So he's traveling here from Bethany. Okay, and um, uh, through Bethphage, heading to the Mount of Olives, and then he's traveling down to the Temple Mount. After the entrance into Jerusalem, Jesus spends the night in Bethany, and the next day, Jesus and the disciples, they're heading back out of Bethany, and they're on the road into Jerusalem, when Jesus sees a fig tree. Now, Mark likes to frequently sandwich incidents. In this case, we have two references to the fig tree. The first interaction occurs with the fig tree before Jesus enters the temple area. Then that's followed by the scene in the temple, after which the fig tree is encountered a second time as he's leaving. Um, and he's coming back the next day. So traditionally in Judaism, there's a belief that the sacred fruit in the Garden of Eden is actually a fig, not an apple. Fig trees are much more common than apples in this area of the world. Uh, another thought is that the sacred fruit, fruit in the Garden of Eden is a pomegranate. Both the fig and the pomegranate are readily available throughout the Holy Land. References to the fig tree are also frequently found throughout the Hebrew Bible. And the fig is considered to be a symbol for Israel. Now, Jesus is hungry, and seeing the fig tree, he looks for fruit. It's actually too early in the season for the tree to bear fruit, because fig trees, they come into leaf in March and April, but they don't bear fruit till later in the summer. So Jesus curses um, this barren fig tree, and it represents a judgment on barren Israel and the fate of Jerusalem for failing to accept his teachings. The temple and the religious leaders are going to face the consequences for their actions. Again, Jesus has transitioned from being a healer to a prophet. So now we have him making these prophetic remarks in regards to Israel and the Israelites who were not willing to listen and hear his message. Mark references words, imagery, and prophecies from the Hebrew scripture. He talks about blooming, um, and blooming symbolizes the end times, God's final kingdom. 
Throughout Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus' powers, his ability to heal, which has led to the restoration of lives back into community. And successful healing reflects faith. There's faith, then, that God will come. He's going to heal and restore Israel back into its proper place. Jesus has modeled the importance of faith and the power of prayer and forgiveness. These are critical elements which provide the foundation for effective restoration. Even though Jesus curses the fig tree, there is hope for future restoration. It is in the power of the truly divine God, then, to forgive. And Jesus' message is just that, is that God wants restoration and healing of Israel. He wants to be in relationship with his children. So here we have a fig tree in bloom. And normally, um, again, I'll mention that they leaf in March and April, and they'll bear fruit in June. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, the only act of power that he will do in this last part of the gospel is one of cursing. The curses address the issues of fear, testing, betrayal, and death in Jerusalem. Jesus now heads toward the Jerusalem temple. Mark references several different prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, and he ties them together to show Jesus' actions as fulfillment of these prophecies. Mark's technique is to take pearls of wisdom from the different books of the Old Testament. He then strings them together to support what is happening with Jesus as fulfillment of the prophecies, the long-awaited Messiah the one that is a prophet, a king, and a priest. The purpose of a prophet is to bring people back to God. Prophets are about reform and reformation, which includes the temple. How does one purify the temple? So we have these visionary prophets about bringing people together in God's house. Now, the story of Jesus in the temple is very dramatic, and it casts Jesus as a reforming and a visionary prophet. It's Passover. Jerusalem is packed with pilgrims. The temple courtyards are filled with the noises and smells of animals, food, and people. Into the midst of all this activity enters Jesus. And then we have him overturning the tables in anger, challenging the den of robbers, asking what has been done with the house of God, a place which is supposed to be set aside for worship and prayer. So Jesus' actions reflect the tradition of the reforming prophet. In other words, purifying temple worship, and also that of the visionary prophet, a place, um, a dream of bringing people together in God's house. Okay, we're on chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 15 through 17. Chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. These are his actions in the temple. They came to Jerusalem, and on entering the temple area, he began to drive out those selling and buying there. He overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He did not permit anyone to carry anything through the temple area. Then he taught them, saying, Is it not written... My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, but you have made it a den of thieves. Let's take a moment to consider the political and religious setting of the temple. Under Roman rule, Jewish religious authorities were politically selected by the empire. And in order to main the Jerusalem temple, Jews were required to pay an estate tax. In addition to the income component of the Jerusalem temple, it's also a pilgrimage site. In Judaism, we have three specific annual pilgrimages that Jews were expected to make to the temple, one of which is Passover. Now, the pilgrims came um, to the temple to make homage to God and also to make atonement. And atonement frequently required a sacrificial animal. The animals they brought for sacrifice were not considered appropriate um, because they often lacked the perfection sought by temple priests for God. 
So as a result, the pilgrims would have to purchase an acceptable sacrificial animal from the temple marketplace. Normally, the temple marketplace is located outside the temple proper, on the grounds in an area enlarged by King Herod the Great, and that area is called the Royal Stoa. Under the columns and covering of the Royal Stoa, blemish-free sacrificial animals, such as doves, which is the most common one animal that was used for sacrifice because it was the least expensive. Um, there would also be sheep and then um, uh, bulls could be purchased. However, these needed to also be bought with specific coinage. There were money changers located under the royal stoa along with the, the merchants for the animals. And not only would they change the money, but they also charged you um, a certain amount for, for the service of changing the money. So as a result, for many of these pilgrims, the cost of a visit to the temple was overwhelming and burdensome. Into this background arrives Jesus. He would have entered the city through a city gate, such as this one, which is called the Lion's Gate in Old Jerusalem. Here we have a woodcut scene of Jesus among the money changers and his overturning of the tables. Here we have a diagram of the layout of the Jerusalem temple. Now, the large number of pilgrims um, have resulted in the money changers um, spilling out from the royal stoa into the court of the Gentiles. So here's the royal stoa here, right? And there's so many of them, and there's so many pilgrims, um, that in order to accommodate the pilgrims, the merchants have now spilled out into this area of the court of the Gentiles. Now, Jews also believe that holiness proceeded from the outside to the inside of the temple. So the further inward you go toward this temple, the more holier it becomes until you enter into the holy of holies. Jesus' anger is that a place set off for religious worship has been turned into a marketplace at the expense of the people who have come to worship God. Adding to this angst is that the marketplace is built into the court of the Gentiles, which was a place for both Gentiles and Jews to come together in worship of God. So the temple was considered a house of prayer for all nations. Here's that visionary prophet aspect of what's going on. Now, as a reforming prophet, Jesus argues that a place of worship for God is not supposed to be a marketplace, let alone one um, which charges, charges, you know, these exorbitant fees at the cost of the worshiper. Another aspect to consider is that under Roman rule, places of worship are critical points for establishing control over people. Jerusalem is a national temple, one in which the Romans have input regarding the exchange of money. Key temples and sanctuaries were banking and financial centers, similar to what we saw when we were at the sanctuary of Pan and Caesarea in Philippi. Roman leadership expects that such places um, are to be well managed at all times. Now, after the incident at the temple, Jesus leaves the city to return the next day, traveling back to the city again the following day. Jesus and the disciples, what did they come across? The fig tree. The tree that had been covered in leaves the day before is now withered to its very roots. The disciples are amazed. This is the tree that Jesus cursed the day before, and the curse has been fulfilled. Jesus affirms the importance of faith and prayer in the power of God, a God who is capable of any and everything. And he reminds the disciples of the importance of forgiveness, asking for it from God and also giving it to others. Jesus' actions add to that growing resentment of the religious leaders, so they challenge him, asking him, with what authority does he act, hoping to catch him in making a blasphemous statement so that they can have him put to death. So Jesus does what? He turns their question on them 
asking instead for them to tell him, where comes the authority for John's baptism? Caught in a trap of their own making, the religious leaders refused to answer. In the parable of the tenants, um, this ends up being the last long parable in the Gospel of Mark. The parable explains the foundations of Jesus' ministry and its failure. God loves the vineyard, Israel. He may get angry at it sometimes, but he will always restore it. So we have the Jewish leaders. They're angry with Jesus. He's stirring up the crowds. They're, they're also concerned and worried about attracting the unwanted attention of the Romans. As a national temple, Roman soldiers are based at Fort Antonio, which is uh, looking down upon the walls of the temple, um, and they maintain watch at all four corners of the temple, keeping guard over the money and the commerce that's taking place. Jewish religious leaders do not want to lose control of the situation. They're enjoying the freedom given them by Rome. They need to deal with Jesus very carefully in order to make sure the crowds who follow and support him don't turn on them. The parable of the tenants uses Old Testament imagery, including God in the vineyard. God's vineyard is Israel and the Israelites, symbolism which is familiar to Mark's Jewish Christian audience. The planting and management of a vineyard would be a story relatable to Mark's agricultural audience. During this time, it is not unusual for landowners to purchase tracts of land which are maintained by tenant farmers. After harvest, the landowner sends someone out to collect the landowner's portion. So the setting of the story is one that's familiar to Mark's audience. We're on chapter 12. We're going to read um, verses 1 through 11. Chapter 12, um, verses 1 through 11, the parable of the tenants. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and left on a journey. At the proper time, he sent a servant to the tenants to obtain from them some of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and that one they beat over the head and treated shamefully. He sent yet another whom they killed. So too many others, some they beat, others they killed. He had one other to send, a beloved son. He sent him to them, last of all, thinking, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come, put the tenants to death, and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture passage? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. They were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, for they realized that he had addressed the parable to them. So they left him and went away. It's Passover. The population in Jerusalem has swelled from 50,000 to several hundreds of thousands. And Jesus is telling this parable to a very large crowd, a parable which clearly addresses the religious leaders. The vineyard is Israel. The tenant farmers are the religious leaders. The owner of the vineyard is God. The servants are messengers of God including prophets, and finally, God's beloved Son, Jesus. The term cornerstone is one found in Psalms, and it's sung during Passover. It's a reference to the enslaved people, the Israelites, who freed from slavery become the cornerstone of God's covenanted nation. In Old Testament tradition, then, it is God who creates the vineyard with the promise that he will always restore the vineyard, and he always does restore the vineyard. So for Jesus, the cornerstone, Israelites have rejected the message he brought from God. 
Ancient vineyards um, frequently have watchtowers. It's right here. Okay, so here you have a watchtower. Um, and these watchtowers are specifically used to keep guard and offer protection against bandits and enemies out to harm the crops. God, the owner of the vineyard, has promised and created a beautiful place, one which needs to be tilled and cared for. And God, we're told, sends his messengers. Messengers in the biblical world are traditionally the prophets. The prophets God sends are repeatedly, we're told, abused, defiled, and killed. And we see that throughout the Old Testament scriptures. The tenants are very hostile. They want the vineyard and the prophets for themselves. So the tenants would be the religious and political leaders. They don't want to hear the message that God has sent. The destruction that will take place, a prophecy, is a result of the corruption of Israel, the vineyard, by Jewish collaborators and the Romans. The landowner, God, talks about his most beloved son, Jesus. So through this parable, Jesus tells his audience exactly what will take place, a prophecy that will be fulfilled. Just like the messenger's prophet sent by God earlier, the tenants will kill the landowner, God's beloved son, Jesus. The corruption of the temple will lead to its own destruction. And whose fault is that? Well, the religious leaders who are political pawns, chosen by Rome and corrupted by power and greed. The prophecy of the destruction of the temple is actually fulfilled in 70 CE. It's destroyed by Rome and it's taken down stone by stone. Here we have the standing cornerstone in Jerusalem. In Judaism, the cornerstone is the people of God, the Israelites. In Christianity, the cornerstone becomes Christ with a message from God for all people. Jesus, as wisdom, now answers four questions from four sons. The questions are specific, and they're in regards to the Torah. And Jesus addresses three schools of theological thought in his answers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. The first question asked by a righteous son is on a point of law. The second question, a mocking question, is asked by a wicked son. The third question is asked by a pious son. And the final question is going to be asked by the father of a son who does not know how to ask a question. So here we have the first question from the righteous son, and it represents the school of the Pharisees, and it addresses the tax laws and Rome. In particular, the image stamped on a denarius. Being part of the Roman Empire, Jews who are not Roman citizens, um, they're, they're, Jews weren't allowed, apparently, to become Roman citizens, they're required to pay a poll tax. The poll tax is an additional tax levied on those living within the empire, but not of Roman citizenship. For many Jews, the poll tax has become a point of contention. The question of whether or not to pay the poll tax is actually meant to catch Jesus as his response is going to have political implications. So if Jesus were to answer no, he would be in trouble with the Romans. Jesus, however, answers wisely, and he uses a form of ancient logical argument which draws conclusions from believed major and minor premises. The major premise is that the denarius carries the image of the emperor. Therefore, those items under the empire belong to the emperor. Jesus then adds the minor premise. Human beings bear the image of God. And he's referring to Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27. Therefore, we should give to God that which is God's. Theologically, the response is one which we are in the world, but not of the world. Use of a certain coin, in this case the Roman denarius, means one is obligated to that system, including obeying the laws the coin represents, in this case the Roman Empire. 
Even today, living in a country and using that country's coinage indicates an agreement to abide by the laws of that country. The Roman Empire is based on a religious cult system of emperor worship. When an emperor died, he was deified by the Senate. Often, if a governor wanted special privileges for the city, he would build a beautiful temple in the name of that emperor. Money would be collected and sent to Rome. In return, the city would receive um, tax benefits. So emperor worship served both religious and political functions. It provided a unifying factor for the empire, and also it provided a test of loyalty. Refusal to participate by offering sacrifices in honor of the emperor would actually result in execution. Now, worship of deities is problematic for Jews and later on for Christians. Jesus' response, acknowledging the image on the coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, you're living in the Roman Empire and this is the emperor's coin, which shows his authority. And give to God what is God is quite astute. Jesus has, what's he done? He's clearly separated the secular from the religious. We are made in the image of God, so we are to be of this world, but not of this world. The Pharisees have again failed in their effort to catch Jesus. Each year, those residing within the Roman Empire would support the emperor's temple cult by paying coinage as part of a tax in honor of the emperor, and also verbally swearing allegiance to the deity of the emperor before witnesses. Within the empire, Jews were the only ones exempt as they refused to worship any deity outside of the one monotheistic God. Now, early Christianity as a sect of Judaism was also exempt from emperor worship. However, later on, when Christianity was clearly separated from Judaism, worship and support of the emperor cult became an issue leading to the persecution and the death of Christians. Here we have a denarius, um, and a denarius was one day's worth of wages for a Roman soldier. Today, it would be equivalent to about $50. The second question is from the Mocking Sun, representing the school of the Sadducees. The Sadducees are associated with the priesthood and Jerusalem aristocracy. They are religious conservatives, believing only in the writings of the Torah, the first five books of the, Old of the Old Testament, which would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy. They reject resurrection and topics that are only, and they only believe in topics that are, um, that are actually within those first five books. So they don't accept resurrection, and they also don't accept the oral traditions. As the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection, they mock the concept of marriage um, at resurrection. So their question to Jesus is regarding the Leverite marriage. This is one in which um, if a man dies and he has no heir, a male child, then his widow is to marry the next brother and try to have a child by him to carry forward the dead man's name. This allows the property and the name of the dead man to continue. And the Sadducees give this example of a widow marrying seven brothers and still having no heir for the first husband. So they're asking, when this woman is resurrected in heaven, the Sadducees want to know, which brother's wife will she be? So Jesus explains that this is not what resurrection looks like in heaven. Resurrection results in a new form, not your current body, but instead a spiritual presence similar to that of an angel. And also, life in heaven is going to be very different from earthly life. The Sadducees mock Jesus and those who believe in that concept of resurrection, which includes both the Pharisees and the Essenes. However, Jesus has shown his authority and wisdom in his interpretation. The Sadducees fail to understand Scripture because why they are caught up in politics. They have failed to understand what God has called them to. 
So we're on chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 24 through 27. Chapter 12, verses 24 through 27. Jesus said to them, Are you not misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God told him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly misled. Um, the catechism that addresses this particular reading um, and the resurrection in regards to the Sadducees is Catechism 993. So Catechism 993, and it talks about the resurrection. So the Sadducees are focused on money, politics, and temple rituals. They have wandered so far from Scripture that they're failing to understand the one true God. And Jesus explains to all the audience, not just the Sadducees, that our God is the God of the living. And resurrection is not about the physical body. In ancient Jewish thought, the soul and the body are together. They're not separate. Um, so the Jewish mind understands resurrection to mean that the soul and the body are together again after je death. And Jesus says, no, it's going to be different. So he's continuing to prepare his disciples and those he teaches for his own resurrection. The third question is from a pious son regarding the greatest commandment. The pious son represents the school of scribes. Now, scribes wrote and recorded scriptures. As such, they were well informed of the 613 laws of the Torah and are considered to be teachers of scripture. If we were to think of scribes today, we would think of them as lawyers. Okay? Since there were so many laws, some laws were considered to be high, and some laws were considered to be low, indicating their degree of importance. So the pious sons, the scribes, are asking Jesus, which is the most important of the 613 laws of God? And Jesus responds just as a scribe, a teacher of scripture, demonstrating his knowledge, his authority, and his wisdom. And he replies with the Shema, which comes from the book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy in Hebrew means to hear. The Shema is the creed of Judaism. It's recited at the beginning of every synagogue service. Pious Jews recite the Shema every morning and evening. And so Jesus responds by stating that there are two great commandments, and then he recites them. So take a look. We're on chapter 12, verse 29 through 31, the greatest commandment. Chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. Jesus replied, the first is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The pious son, the scribe, agrees with Jesus' answer. So Jesus has skillfully woven together parts of scripture showing that the love of God and love of neighbor together reflect true worship. So this incident with the pious son um, the scribe is striking um, because Mark shows that Jesus is not at odds with all the scribes of the temple. In fact, Jesus is actually in perfect agreement with those who taught the very central tenets of Judaism. Jesus, through his mission, has expanded worship beyond love of the Jewish neighbor. It's no longer just the Israelite, but you're also called to love the Gentile. So the catechism in regards to love of neighbor is 2196, catechism 2196. And it talks about the love of neighbor. For Mark's Gentile Christian audience in Rome, this is a very affirming and key interpretation that's been provided by Jesus. So here we have the full Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy 6.4 and again begins with here. That's what the word Deuteronomy means. Later, 
Jewish tradition developed a three-part Shema, uh, prayer that includes Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 29, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41. And tradition teaches that these three parts together cover all aspects of the Ten Commandments. So let's read this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The fourth question is posed as a riddle by Jesus in regards to the meaning of Messiah. The religious leaders have questioned the authority of Jesus every step along the way. They're unwilling to accept him as the Messiah. So Jesus' riddle then challenges them. If the coming Messiah is a son of David, then why does David refer to him as my Lord? A master of the scripture, Jesus has posed um, one scripture, God's promise to David, which we find in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, in which he's going to raise up an heir from his loins. And he juxtaposes that with Psalm 110, in which um, we hear the Lord said to my Lord. And there is no answer to the riddle. The point being that Jesus is not the conventional expected Messiah. He is not a warrior king, priest, and prophet. In fact, he's far greater than a mere descendant son of David. Hence the reference as my Lord. So take a look at chapter 12, verses 35 through 7. Chapter 12, verses 35 through 7. 37. As Jesus was teaching in the temple area, he said, How do the scribes claim that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? The great crowd heard this with delight. To each challenge, Jesus responds with authority. As living wisdom, he responds to challenges and arguments with great knowledge and insight, and he's doing this all in front of the crowds. The religious leaders aren't able um, to do anything because they're afraid of retaliation from the crowds. Jesus addresses the issue of the temple, the rich and the poor. The temple and those that manage the temple are focused on their own profit. In contrast, the poor give all they have. And Jesus denounces the greed of the scribes, these teachers of the law, and their behavior, um, because that includes their failure to care for the house of the widows. And Jesus teaches that the behavior of the scribes is behavior that needs to be avoided, specifically in four areas. First, the scribes wear special clothing with fringes that come nearly to the ground. So their dress sets them apart, making them special, adding to their authority. Second, um, the scribes thrive on adulation they receive from those with lesser status, who in turn are practicing false piety. Third, they use their status to prey on the weak and vulnerable. And finally, fourth, their public prayers are done intentionally to impress those who listen. So in the synagogue um, is a bench located in front of the ark. Um, the ark holds the sacred sc uh, scrolls of the Torah. And those who sit on this special bench, they're held in high honor and they can be seen by any, everyone that's attending the synagogue. And frequently those sitting on the bench are the scribes. As teachers of the law, scribes are not paid a regular wage. Um, instead, they're dependent on the generosity of their patrons. And what happens is that such a system leads to abuse, in particular, the abuse of the widows who are very vulnerable because the scribes are supposed to oversee and take care of them, and they end up wiping out all their savings. So now Jesus notes, here we have this poor widow who has 
very little to give, and yet here she is in the synagogue giving her few small coins willingly. So her gift is truly a gift to God versus it's one, um, it, it actually is one that reflects uh, love of the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength versus what we have uh, from the scribes who are corrupt and greedy and only give a little portion of excess. Okay, so uh, we're on chapter 12. We're going to look at um, verses 41 through 44. So Jesus is in, the, is in the temple now. So he's sitting down opposite the treasury and he's observing how the crowd put money into the treasury. So chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. He sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they have all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. So here we have an example of a mite, or in this instance, mites. They're also known as leptons. It's the smallest copper or bronze coin currency among Jews during the time of Jesus. The mite was first struck with images of Hebrew legends, under the Maccabees, and then under the Roman procreators, um, the coins uh, carried imprints of Greek legends. And according to Mark, the mite or the lepton was worth about a quarter of a cent. So it would have taken 64 mites to equal one denarius. Now the temple treasury is located in the court of women. Both men and women are allowed in this court. Women can go no further into the temple buildings. Throughout the women's court are inverted trumpet-shaped receptacles for money donations, a total of 13. The widow Jesus refers to has nearly nothing as a result of the scribes having preyed on her vulnerability and taken most of what was left to her by her husband. Her meager donation of mites is hardly heard but visual to all present. She has given everything. In contrast, the wealthy give only a portion and make a show of their donation as their many coins noisily clink into the donation receptacle. Jesus teaches to give from the heart, to give honestly, and to give as God has given the receiver. Chapter 13 opens with Jesus sitting on top of Mount Olive. Jesus gives what is known as the Olivet Discourse, the longest recorded message in Mark. As a prophet, Jesus is preaching about a time of pending crisis, the fall of the temple for the second time. Let's take a moment to review the first time the temple fell. Prophets warned the people to reform, to return to God, or be prepared for the consequences of God's wrath. The people ignored the warnings and abused and killed the prophets. The first temple fell to the Babylonians in 586 BCE, the Israelites had gone astray from God, and God allowed the fall to take place along with the dispersion of the people from their homeland. Jesus now warns of another similar occurrence to take place, this time with the second temple. Jesus warns of the misery and persecutions that will follow, including floggings in synagogues and foreign occupation. Jesus' prophecy will be fulfilled, as in 70 CE, the Romans will destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Thousands of Jews will be killed. Those remaining throughout the empire will suffer. We're on chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 and the prophecy Jesus made. Chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The destruction of the temple foretold. As he was making his way out of the temple area, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what stones and what buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. 
Jesus' message is a clear warning of the need for temple return, reform, and a return to the covenant between God and his chosen people. Now, there are two time periods being addressed in the prophecy. The first addresses Jesus and the crowds who support and follow him versus the political powers that are hostile. So the persecution is not going to take place during the time of Jesus. The second time period addresses Mark's audience. Christianity has grown. Rome has or is about to destroy the temple. Christians face hostility and persecution. Mark's community needs encouragement to persevere to the end. Their reward will be great. Jesus' message continues with the apocalyptic language and the imagery of the end times, similar to that found in the book of Revelation. Throughout the prophecy runs a thread of hope and promise, which is important for Mark's persecuted Christians to hear. God will come. He will not forget his remnants. God fulfills his promises. Here we have a model of what ancient Jerusalem looked like during the time of Jesus. Note the massive walls around the temple and also look at the walls that surround the city. And now we can see the remnants of the walls, a reminder of the power of the Roman emperor who had the ability to tear down a temple, a city, and its walls. In this image, we have the fall of Jerusalem. The event is memorialized in a triumphant arch in honor of General Titus, who led the successful attack on Jerusalem. Jews rebelled several times beginning in 66 CE, until the Romans finally decreed enough. In 70 CE, they built ramparts along the city walls, and after five months of heavy fighting, they broke through the burning um, city and the temple, and they continued to lay fires and waste everywhere. An estimated one million Jews were killed during the months of battle and afterwards. Any remaining captives, approximately 96,000, were taken to Caesarea Maritima, and they were sold off as slaves. Throughout the Roman Empire, Jewish places of worship, synagogues were destroyed. Jews were killed and persecuted as a reminder of the strength and power of the Roman Empire to control anyone that would come up against them. The Jewish historian Flavius Josephus recorded this in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. The city was filled with pilgrims for Passover when the siege began with the Roman army surrounding the city. Meanwhile, Jewish political factions fought among themselves. The Zealots, being a militant and rebellious group, fought with both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The fighting escalated to the point where they killed each other. The siege led to starvation and death, included horrific stories of the cannibalizing of children and babies. The fall of Jerusalem was tragic. Jesus' prophecy about the temple and its fulfillment is striking. The Jewish people, the religious groups, those who chose to ignore the warning of the prophet Jesus are accountable for much of what happened to Jerusalem, along with the Romans. Now, Jesus describes an apocalyptic end with references to doom and the abomination of desolation. Antiochus ruled Jerusalem for a short period of time and attempted to destroy Jews and their faith. During his rule, he brought idols into the temple grounds and slaughtered pigs on the altar. He forbade Jewish women from circumcising their male babies, and if they were caught circumcising the infant, the babies were killed and then hung around the mother's neck. Despite the abuse of Antiochus, the Jews persevered. Jesus foretells that similar events will take place in the future. He gives instruction and consolation, encouraging the disciples to stay faithful and obedient to God throughout these trials. He warns that it is better to flee from Jerusalem during this time as it will be destroyed. He promises that God will intervene, but only after the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus urges vigilance as no one knows when the Father will appear. Jesus explains that the tribulation that follows is a result of the destruction of the temple. However, God's kingdom will prevail in the end. 
God is merciful, and the suffering will only be for a short time. So let's take a look at chapter 13, verses 14 through 20, and we can get a sense of the tribulation that's going to take place and the language that's given. When you see the desolating abomination standing where he should not, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains, and a person on a housetop must not go down or enter to get anything out of his house, and a person in a field must not return to get his cloak. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that this does not happen in winter, for those times will have tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of God's creation until now, nor ever will be. If the Lord had not shortened those days, no one would be saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he did not shorten the days. Now Jesus promises um, he, the second son of Adam, will return and collect God's chosen people, the Israelites, and now too those who believe and have faith in Jesus, the Gentiles. So we're still on chapter 13. We're going to look at the promise of return. So that's verses 26 and 27. Chapter 13, verses 26 and 27. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. Now, the elect refers to all who believe in Jesus and his message. The message is no longer exclusive to the Israelites, but is inclusive for all believers. Jesus promises a future of glory for all who follow him, who carry the cross, and who persevere in faith. Remember, Mark's audience is facing persecution now. They want to know when this will all take place. Many people thought that Jesus would return quickly after the re resurrection, but first 10 years go by, then 20 years go by, and now it's been 30 years. 30 years have passed without the return of Jesus. So nobody knows when the return will take place, only God. God's time is different than ours, a reminder to be watchful and prepared. So the latter half of Mark's gospel emphasizes the themes of watchfulness, alertness, and readiness. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, remember his encounter with a fig tree, one in which um, he cursed the fig tree for its lack of fruit, and then the following day, the fig tree is found withered. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. A withered tree, therefore, is a sign of the rejection of Israel by God. As Jesus continues his prophecy, he now starts to describe a blooming fig tree. And the blooming fig tree is a sign of God's kingdom. It's a sign of hope and healing. The withered fig tree, the rejected Israel, will be restored. Jesus then gives a parable on watchfulness. In this parable, the master of the vineyard, God, leaves the care of the vineyard, the sacred space where God dwells, to trusted servants with a warning that he will return. The servants do not know when the master will return. It can be at any moment on any day. Here we have um, a blooming fig tree, God's kingdom, a sign of hope and healing. Now Jesus emphasizes the need to be ready, to be prepared, and to be watchful. He warns the disciples to watch out for themselves as there will be a time of false messiahs and prophets. Now the parable repeats the word watch three times with a reminder that only God the Father knows when the end will come. For Mark's audience, the reference to time is based on the Roman watch cycle, which is broken into four segments, the evening watch, a midnight watch, the cock crow watch, and the morning watch. That cock crow watch reminds us that Mark's audience is familiar with farming language. It's interesting to note that Mark's gospel, being one of action, has 18 miracles, but only four parables. Chapter 14 begins the Passion narrative, opening on a note of foreboding as the religious leaders are intent on the death of Jesus. The story points to the two tensions within the religious leaders. 
Instead of focusing on Passover and celebrating the goodness of God, they demonstrate to us their corruptness in understanding and belief as they seek to kill the very Son of God. Meanwhile, Jesus and the disciples are back in Bethany, sharing a meal in the home of Simon the leper, a person Jesus has healed. And in the midst of this meal, a woman enters with an alabaster jar, a spikenard perfume oil. She then proceeds to break the jar and pour the entire contents on the head of Jesus. This results in an uproar of dismay and anger from the disciples. Now note that in Mark's Gospel and also Matthew's, the woman pours the oil on the head of Jesus. In the Gospels of Luke and John, the oil is actually poured out on Jesus' feet. That action of pouring the oil on Jesus' head is one of anointing such as in the anointing of kings. Just as a king anointed to his, is anointed to his kingship, so too are the persons anointed in preparation of burial. The scene then is prophetic. Um, so we have this woman is preparing Jesus for something that is about to happen. Now the disciples' reaction is they're upset, and the guests also become upset. upset. Let's uh, take a moment to read the scene, and I want you to note the details. So, chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. Chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. The anointing at Bethany. When he was in Bethany, reclining at table in the house of Simon the Lipper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly, genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. Why has there been this waste of perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days' wages and the money given to the poor. They were infuriated with her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing. The poor you will always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. First of all, the woman has no name, but she does. Jesus says she'll be remembered forever as the one who loved me enough to anoint me with costly oil in preparation for my burial. The disciples do not understand, as they still don't believe that Jesus, the Messiah, will be sacrificed on the cross. Now, Jesus' point in regards to the woman's action is to highlight there are many ways to love. Love is not only by your heart, but it's also shown through actions. Notice the event is very detailed, describing that the oil um, is contained in an alabaster jar. Alabaster is an expensive stone. And so the jar would have been costly to purchase. The spikenard or nard oil um, contained in the jar is worth a year's wages. Dramatically, the woman breaks the jar and pours the entire contents on the head of Jesus. And Jesus' response is to take the moment and teach on love. The woman has shown through her actions that she values Jesus and his life. Judas who is at the table along with the other disciples, is also upset with the extravagant waste. Um, It is at this moment that he becomes a traitor. He goes off to the chief priests and asks what they will give him for turning Jesus over to them. They are willing to give Judas his money. They're willing to give Judas money. And so the deal is struck. Judas now will figure out the time and place for the exchange. So here we have a diagram of seating arrangements in a triclinium. Uh, The position would have been reclining. Notice where they're sitting. So you have the host family sitting here toward the front of the door. And here you have the family, um, the the guests that are of the highest status. And then you have low status people. So Jesus and the disciples would be sitting around the table um, in one of these, in the similar arrangement. Um, in the house of Simon the leper. An ancient triclinium, the remains in Pompeii, Italy, 
Notice again the reclining, in this case they're built in um, into the walls uh, of stone, and they would have been covered with luxurious bedding of some kind to make it comfortable for the guest. Here we have a digital reconstruction of a triclinium in Pompeii, and you can see the detail with the mosaic flooring and the artworks on the wall. An ancient alabaster jar made for holding oil, and the perfume um, type of bottles like this one would be relatively small. Um, the jar is traditionally sealed with a long neck, which is then broken off uh, when the contents are used, and one jar contains enough for one application of the oil. So Jesus' response, remember, to the disciples' objection of waste is to remind them that acts of generosity towards suffering humanity um, do not substitute for gestures of love toward individuals. Both are actually required of God's disciples. So the spikenard plant is found in very high altitudes, um, 9,800 to 16,400 feet. Um, so you find the plant in the Himalayas of Nepal, China, and India. The plant actually grows to about three feet in height. It's the roots of the spikenard plant which are harvested and crushed, and then they're distill distilled, which produces this aromatic amber-colored essential oil, um, which is commonly called nard oil. It's very thick in its consistency, and nard oil is used as a perfume, as an incense, as a sedative, and as a herbal medicine to fight insomnia. It helps with birthing difficulties um, and also other minor ailments. In fact, Pope Francis has included this plant in his coat of arms because of its healing restorative powers. So Mark made three points in regards to the woman, the oil, and Jesus. One, the act is one of true generosity by the woman. The woman anoints Jesus' head, anticipating his death. Anointing um, is, and th thirdly, um, anointing is associated with kings. Jesus is now shown as an anointed royal figure who goes to his death. So, first, the act is one of true generosity. Second, the woman has anointed Jesus' head. And third, anointing is associated with kings. The action now moves forward to the Passover Supper and Eucharist. Jesus plans ahead, showing he is in control. And just as he told two disciples to go get a colt for his ride into Jerusalem, Jesus now tells two disciples to follow a man carrying water. This man is going to take them to a house where they will find a room to use for the meal. So the disciples follow Jesus' directions and they find this man carrying water and he, they and follow him as they're directed to an upper room in a house. Now, during Passover, because of the crowds, it was not unusual for people to visit homes and request a room for a family meal gathering. They were not expected to pay for the room as Israelites were prepared for requests of pilgrims and were expected to show hospitality to travelers. Some scholars have suggested the room was actually in Mark's mother's home. There are several different suggestions as to where the meal took place, resulting in a variety of pilgrimage sites in Jerusalem. Preparations for Passover include obtaining food and drink for a meal, which um, needs to have unleavened bread, wine, bitter herbs, and a lamb. And the Passover meal that's going to take place with the disciples occurs in three sections. So First, we have the preparations. You know, they have to find the room and set it up. Second, we have the dialogue that takes place, um, and it involves betrayal. And finally, we move into a monologue by Jesus um, toward the end of the meal with the blessing um, of the bread, the cup, uh, and then a conclusion with a hem. So the room has been prepared, and the disciples are reclined around a table for a meal. And the theme now is one of betrayal in which the term for betrayal that's being used is hand over. Jesus notes that one who is actually eating with, with them in the intimacy of the table fellowship at Passover will be the traitor. And Jesus quotes Psalm 
41 verse 10 as the son of man being betrayed. The action of Judas then fulfills prophecy. So let's look at this quote. Um, we're on chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 20 and 21. Chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. He said to them, One of the twelve, the one who dips with me into the dish, for the Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. In using the term hand over, we tend to think in terms of passing something on, such as in history, something on for our children, something on for the next generation. However, in this instance, it is a betrayal to hand over someone, to actually give them over. So yes, the story will be carried forward, but as a story of betrayal. During the Passover meal, we have those gestures which are familiar to us in the Eucharist of the Christian Mass, the gestures which are part of the synagogue service, to take, to break, to bless, and to share the bread of God. So let's take a look at um, this action which we are so f familiar with in our Eucharist. We're on chapter 14. We're going to look, take a look at verses 22 through 26, the Lord's Supper. While they were eating... He took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Passover is about reliving a past event, the Exodus, and recalling God's grace of the past and in the present. Jesus gives the expected blessing of thankfulness for God's grace. However, he's now added new elements. The bread becomes his body, the cup becomes his blood. And notice Jesus doesn't say it's a new covenant, However, his actions have made it a covenant, a contract between God and man. So the, at the end of the Passover meal, um, it concludes with a hymn of thanksgiving. And the hymn, come, and the hymn comes from one of the Psalms. Um, and they're from the Psalms 114 through 118 is where the traditional hymns come for this particular blessing. The Catechism for the Sacrament of the Eucharist, which focuses on this reading, is 1338, Catechism 1338. In Jerusalem, this site in front of you is considered to be the location of the house holding the upper room where the Last Supper took place, the Seneca. The Crusaders built on the site, securing the location for the pilgrims. The house would have uh, you know, looked different, obviously, during the time of Jesus. So inside... Um, Here's a view of the room itself. Uh, remember, it's a crusader-built um, building. And the room is called the Cenacle, and it's actually located on Mount Zion. An example of an ancient water jar, similar to what the man would have been carrying. They would need water to wash their hands and feet prior to the meal. Originally, the Passover meal was eaten while standing, reenacting the actual Passover events, being, in other words, you had to be your loins girded and ready to escape when the call came. Um, so they were, you know, fleeing from Pharaoh, they were going to flee Egypt and sla slavery. But by the time of Jesus, it had become customary to eat the meal reclining. Each element on the Passover plate has significance. The salt water, right here, um, represents the tears of slavery. The lamb bone is in remembrance of the sacrifice of the lamb's life, whose blood was then um, taken and, and painted above the door lentil, protecting the Jewish people from the angel of death. The bitter herbs are a reminder of the life of slavery. 
Harosette is a, a very tasty apple mixture. It's a reminder of the mortar used to build the pyramids for Pharaoh. Parsley is a spring vegetable, and it's a symbol of the renewal of life. And the roasted or the hard-boiled egg is a symbol um, of new life outside of Egypt. And the matzah represents the unleavened bread, a reminder that there was no time to use yeast to let the bread rise prior to their escape from Pharaoh. The traditional Passover meal takes several hours to complete as it includes readings and hymns. The Kaddish cup, uh, Mark's gospel highlights that they all share the one cup. To be in communion, they're all sharing one cup. These are Jesus' disciples. These are the ones Jesus has called to carry his message forward. So the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, it's a very close relationship. And that's reflected in their sharing of that one cup. Despite the significance of the moment, not one of them are going to be there for him at the end. They will break his heart as they abandon him. Now, Mark intentionally brings two contrasting events together. The Last Supper is a special time for Jesus and the disciples. Judas is among the disciples. The tension is palpable. Drinking from the cup in the ancient Jewish world implies the sharing of communion with the other person, including each other's life and destiny. The meal reflects the trust among the disciples and Jesus, as they're dipping bread in another person's dish, which emphasizes that bond of hospitality and intimacy, one that is about to be broken by betrayal. Jesus now makes a prediction that none will stand by him at his death and that after his resurrection, he will go before the disciples of Galilee. Peter immediately denies the possibility of abandoning Jesus. Jesus affirms that Peter will deny him, not once, but three times before the cock crows. The need for watchfulness is repeated three times, and yet none of them will be watchful. In the end, Jesus will be alone. The meal and the rite is concluded. Jesus and his closest disciples now head off to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And in the garden, we'll have two incidents of betrayal. One is the betrayal of Jesus um, by his close disciple Peter, and the other by the disciple Judas. Jesus takes three disciples to the garden. He takes Peter, John, and James. These are the same three disciples who were with him at the raising of Jairus' daughter and also at the transfiguration. Jesus asks the disciples to stay awake and be watchful while he prays. And yet Jesus will look up from his prayers three times to find the disciples sound asleep. They have failed to follow the command Jesus gave to all followers to be watchful and to be ready. Remember the, the parables that he just gave emphasizing watchfulness and preparedness? The garden scene captures the humanness of Jesus. He struggles with what he knows he is going to face. Jesus is not invincible. He's not looking forward to martyrdom. As a human being, he struggles with taking the cup of suffering and death. He calls out to Abba, Father, to take the cup away from him. The cup is not a blessing. However, in all things, Jesus has an overriding sense of obedience to the will of God. If God wills Jesus sacrifice his life, he will do so. Meanwhile, Peter is not awake. He's fallen asleep three times through Jesus' prayerful struggles. So Jesus now refers to him as Simon. Peter, if you remember, is the name that Jesus gave Simon as he transformed into a believer of rock-like faith. And now he's fallen away from that faith. So here we have a chart um, which I thought would be helpful. Uh, as we can understand the garden scene, in contrast to what took place in the transfiguration, everything now has been reversed. In the garden scene, well, let's begin with the transfiguration. 
In the Transfiguration, Jesus is radiant and dazzling. He climbs up the mountains. He ascends the mountain. It's all about blessing. Peter is wide awake, and he shows this incredible faith. Um, he's named Peter. Then we move to the garden scene. We have Jesus troubled and distressed. He's fallen to the ground on his knees. He's praying. He pleads with God to take away the cup. He doesn't think this is a blessing. Peter falls asleep, and his name is changed from Peter back to Simon. Here we can see the route to Gethsemane, first from the upper room and then from the garden to the house of the high priest Caiaphas. So we've got the upper room, and they leave there after their meal, and they go up to the garden of Gethsemane. And now as we move into the next scene, the mob will arrive, led by Judas, and he'll be taken off. Jesus will be taken down to Caiaphas's house. This beautiful garden of Gethsemane is located at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Today it's protected by the walled grounds of the Church of All Nations, also known as the Church of Agony. It's a peaceful garden uh, among a grove of ancient olive trees. During his prayers and his struggles with the cup God has placed before him, Jesus calls out Abba, which is the Aramaic term for father. Now, Mark has used Aramaic um, terms in several different scenes, including the raising of the girl from the dead, Talitha, in the healing of the deaf mute, when he said Ephetha, and now in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he calls up Abba. And when we move to the final scenes, um, Jesus will cry out from the cross, Eloi, Eloi. Jesus is looking at his sleeping disciples, and he calls out to them to get up. You are raised up. Contrary to being raised up and ready to serve the Lord, they are sound asleep. We now transition into the scene of betrayal. The details in the scene provided by Mark are not found in the other Gospels. Judas arrives in the garden, and he's accompanied by an armed mob sent by the religious leaders. And straight away, Judas approaches Jesus, calling him rabbi and kissing him on his cheeks. Now, by kissing Jesus in this traditional manner, Judas has used a sign of respect, trust, and friendship as a method of identifying Jesus for the religious leaders. This sign has now become one of treachery and betrayal. Judas has arrived with an armed mob, one carrying clubs and swords. Notice how Mark uses that term straight away to describe Judas's approach toward Jesus, a term that throughout the gospel has been used in conjunction with the righteous. In the midst of the commotion, one of the disciples cuts off the ear of a servant of Caiaphas. James and John, um, the two disciples that are with him along with Peter, they've deserted the scene. So the only disciple remaining with Jesus is Peter. Jesus challenges those who have come to arrest him in the dark of night, questioning the ethics of their actions. He's been out in the open. He's been unarmed. They could have approached him in the daylight instead of covertly in the darkness. The scene ends with a reference to a young man caught running away naked, leaving behind a fine linen garment in the hands of the guard. The garment indicates the young man is from a wealthy family. And the young man has been in such a hurry to get dressed and follow the crowds that he had no undergarments. Now in his fear, he leaves what he does have and runs off naked. So he was not prepared. The tribulation has begun. Everything has now turned. The beloved disciples of Jesus have left him. Jesus has been betrayed and captured. I hope in today's presentation um, you, were, you found it helpful bringing into focus the history, the context, and the significance of these sad events for Mark's Gentile um, Christian audience in Rome. Struggling with persecution and learning to understand and appreciate the message of Jesus and the promise of salvation. So let's take a look at our reflection questions. The first one, 
How do we keep people from coming to God by our actions? Two, have you ever been persecuted for your faith in Christ? And three, have you ever been betrayed by someone you trusted? I look forward to you joining us for Unit 5 on the Gospel of Mark. We'll, we will be covering the remainder of Chapter 14 through the end of Mark, which would be Chapter 16. I wish each of you a blessed day. Let us close together with the prayer our Father taught us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.